It's my privilege to introduce to you now Ambassador Catherine Russell. Uh, and I have known Catherine, I think, for a couple of years now. Uh, we first met in her office on the seventh floor of the State Department uh, and had a fantastic conversation then about women, peace, and security. And I think we're going to have another fantastic conversation uh, today. But let me tell you a little bit more about um, Ambassador uh, Kathy Russell. Kathy Russell ha was described by President Obama as a, quote, longtime advocate for women, for justice, and for fairness, unquote. During the Obama administration, Kathy shaped U.S. foreign policy on gender equality. In the first term, she guided the creation of the first ever U.S. global strategy on gender-based violence at the White House, where she served as deputy assistant to the president and chief of staff to second lady, Dr. Jill Biden. In the second term, she led the U.S. Department of State in integrating women's issues into U.S. foreign policy as the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. During her time as Ambassador, Kathy was responsible for U.S. efforts to advance gender equality and the status of women and girls around the world, developing a toolbox of policies, programs, partnerships, and diplomatic efforts. She traveled to nearly 50 countries. That's amazing, Kathy. <laughs> 50 countries, developed groundbreaking U.S. government policies and tested new approaches, coordinated interagency efforts, and built partnerships with Fortune 50 and Fortune 500 companies. She also worked with foreign governments, multilateral organizations, and civil society on a full range of issues, from women's economic empowerment to adolescent girls' education to women's roles in peace and security. Kathy previously served as the senior advisor on international women's issues on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where she drafted the International Violence Against Women Act, the first piece of U.S. legislation that proposed streamlining and expanding U.S. efforts on gender-based violence. During the Clinton administration, Kathy was a trusted advisor to both the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General on a range of policy and legislative matters in her role as Associate Deputy Attorney General. Previously, she served as staff director of the Senate Judiciary Committee during the development of the landmark Violence Against Women Act and the confirmations of Supreme Court Justices Stephen Breyer and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you very much for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She also worked as senior counsel to Senator Patrick Leahy, whom she advised on constitutional issues, including privacy and First Amendment matters, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and the Freedom of Information Act. I didn't know that. As a leading voice on international women's issues, Kathy has addressed hundreds of international audiences from the United Nations to the Philippines Women's University. She has been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Council on Foreign Relations and elsewhere. Kathy graduated magna cum laude from Boston College and received a JD from George Washington University. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband, Tom Donnellan, and two children. Join with me in welcoming Ambassador Kathy Russell. It's so funny when I hear that I realize I've been around for a very long time, which is like, oh my goodness, it's just kind of shocking. In any case, Valerie, thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Um, I've heard so much about this institute, and it's the first time I've, I've been able to come to this school, and I, I just really enjoy it, and I'm, I'm delighted to, to have the opportunity to be here. Um, I especially want to thank the Texas A&M School, um, which really is the leading school in the country when it comes to women, peace, and security, um, and also the George Bush um, Institute, which is really impressive. I've been there. I, I've, ha I've had the opportunity to travel there, and I just really appreciate the tremendous work that you're doing. So as Amanda mentioned, um, First Lady uh, Laura Bush really has been a leading voice um, on, on these issues. And it was about 16 years ago, I think, that she made her historic radio address on women in Afghanistan. And that really was a big deal at the time. I remember that so well. And nearly a decade after she, since she's left the White House, she continues to advocate for women and girls there and around the world. Um, that legacy of work speaks to her commitment to these issues, and it also speaks to the idea that women, peace, and security truly is a bipartisan issue. When I was at the State Department, one of the, I would say, not great things I had to do was testify before Congress. Uh, it wasn't always pleasant. Um, but the one thing I would say is that it was never a, it was never a partisan issue on these, on these matters. You know, it was, there was broad support um, for the notion that women and girls around the world deserved our support and our, 
um, help. And I think that that was something that really um, was profoundly important to me and to the success of our work. And along those lines, I was so delighted to see that Congress recently passed the Women, Peace, and Security Act, which the President signed into law last month. <clears throat> it's a bipartisan piece of legislation, and it makes women's participation a permanent element of U.S. foreign policy, subject to congressional oversight, which is so important. It, it mandates that the administration have a strategy in place to improve the participation of women in peace and security efforts within the next year. Um, again, a lot of that work we had done um, through, through the, our national action plan, but to have it um, codified by Congress and to have that, the role of Congress be critically important to that it was, was, I think, a huge step forward. Um, this bill passed despite, I think you have to say, what you know, is political uh, polarization in, in Congress. And that really um, is to the credit of leaders on Capitol Hill, including Senator Jean Shaheen, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, uh, Congressman Ed Royce. Um, today you're going to hear from, from Representative Granger, who's been a tremendous supporter of these issues. And I think across the board, we've seen that this is uh, something that members of Congress seem to intuitively understand that it's, it's worth supporting this. It's also a credit to the civil society organizations that worked so hard to get this bill over the finish line. Let's see if I can do this. I'm doing two things at once. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to show Mrs. Bush when I said, talked about her. Um, <laughs> I'm not good at the PowerPoint piece. So. so here at home, women in the military have continued to make some progress as well. This year, the Army saw its first group of women make it through military training, which was great. And while the Marines had a woman complete its inf infantry officer course for the first time. So women in the United States are starting to reach some of these milestones. And that sends an important message to women and girls both here at home and around the world. And importantly, it will improve our military's ability to be successful in a range of opera operational settings. This progress is part of a years-long effort in the United States on WPS through UN resolutions and then under President Obama through the US National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. The United States has been a key player on advancing the WPS agenda around the world. But despite some progress, we all know the record has been somewhat mixed. We've seen modest increases in the numbers of women in peacekeeping missions, both as police and on the military side. More countries have launched their own national action plans, and there have been some successful but far too few efforts to get more women to the peace table as negotiators and as mediators, despite clear evidence that their participation is likely to increase the success of those efforts. There are some great examples where women have played key roles in peace efforts. In Colombia, peace negotiations established a gender subcommission, which included representatives from both sides of the conflict. And women's groups and survivors of gender-based violence were represented in that process. In Liberia, women have built on their legacy of peacemaking and on the historic presidency of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf by working to prevent conflict in the lead up to last month's election. They held marches for peace and distributed copies of the movie Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which if you haven't seen, I don't know, Valerie, if you show that film, but it's a great film to really show what, what the women were able to do as a really important reminder of the roles women played in defining Liberia's future. But there is no progress that, no question that progress has been incredibly slow. Um, at the State Department, we would run into a problem that we used to call the first then mindset, which was essentially that people would kind of get the arguments and we would show the data and say it's really critical to have women in these, uh, particularly in these peace negotiations, and they would say, oh yes, we agree, but first we have to do X, whatever the first was. There was always something, right? First we need to get more women uh, trained, first we need to get the peace agreement reached, and then we can bring women into the process. In the Philippines, the government was able to bring more women to the table by actually putting more seats in the room, but that's difficult if none of the parties believe that women's voices actually matter. It can be easier to bring women into the process if they already play important roles in the politics of the country or in the economy. The Filipino government leader's negotiator was a woman named Miriam Coronel Ferrer, who's really amazing. And she was the one who made sure that more women came to the table there. And in Liberia, women play already an important role in the economy. So their participation and their power made, it, made a difference when it came time to include them in the, in the peace negotiations. So which is why, and this is my central message for you today, it is difficult to separate the women, peace, and security agenda from the broader 
agenda for women's rights. These issues simply do not exist in a vacuum. Investing in women isn't just critical to building the peace after war. It's fundamental to preventing violent conflict and fragility in the first place. After all, places where women and girls live free from violence and have access to equal opportunity are more prosperous and less vulnerable to conflict. Women's health, education, safety all play a role in the ability to participate in politics, in peace, or the economy. It's common sense. This is the most important insight I've gained since working on these issues. Our efforts in any area related to women will be more successful if they're part of a broader, more comprehensive effort to raise the status of women and girls. So for us, that meant we have to encourage women's political participation. We need to support efforts to get them into the formal economy. We need to address barriers like gender-based violence. And we need to make sure that girls are getting educated. Only then will we truly be able to shift the norms that constrain women and limit their opportunities everywhere. These challenges are extraordinary. There's no question about it. And US leadership has been critical. From the Bush years through the Obama years, the United States has been the essential voice. We've worked diplomatically and through our programming to support women and girls around the world. Of course, we're in a different world today. And I'm not entirely sure how America First translates into this arena. I'd like to highlight several areas where we really cannot afford to lose any ground. When I served in the, oh, see, I'm sorry, I keep getting behind on these things. Oh, goodness, I'm so far behind. OK. I don't even know where I am. Let's just ignore those things. OK. Um, when I served in the administration, I traveled to Egypt. Um, Valerie mentioned that I traveled to a lot of countries. And Egypt was a, a, an incredibly interesting place. They have very, very high rates of female genital mutilation and cutting in Egypt. Um, there had been some progress in reducing the prevalence, but high birth rates were threatening to really undermine the advances that we had made. So while I was there, I met with an artist named Nada who traveled around Egypt performing a play about FGMC, of all things. And believe it or not, it was actually a funny play. And that was the key to its success. She would go into communities, and they would perform this play. Um, you know, there as in most places, FGMC is a, is a taboo subject. Communities don't want to talk about it, and men and women together certainly don't talk about it. But by using art and humor, Nada would get people together to discuss this incredibly difficult topic. Her work was made possible through, through the UN Population Fund. UNFPA works on reproductive health in more than 150 countries, but this administration has decided to cut off US funding for that agency. The administration has also restricted almost $9 billion in global health funding, including in the PEPFAR program, which is one of President George W. Bush's greatest legacies. Um, because of this decision to reimpose what's known as the gag rule, we know that there will be more unintended pregnancies, more unsafe abortions, and more mothers dying giving birth around the world. This is particularly devastating news for the developing world, where women's health is already a huge challenge. Women lack access to reproductive rights and face high levels of HIV AIDS and gender-based violence. These challenges complicate our efforts with respect to women's participation in peace and security. Women must be secure, healthy, and educated to live up to their potential and to fully participate in their societies. In addition to cutting and restricting funding, this administration seems to have little regard, honestly, for the foreign policy professionals at the Department of State. Um, there was a piece, I think it was yesterday in the New York Times, which if you haven't looked at it, it was on an editorial piece about what's going on there, which is really quite something. But essentially, um, long-standing priorities like multilateral trade, environment, climate, and democracy have been sidelined. Senior career diplomats are leaving in really alarming numbers. Um, programs to recruit and train diverse talent have uncertain futures, and some have been frozen. And rumors about this redesign that will include huge cuts have really left the staff there demoralized. This is incredibly short-sighted and really damaging to our country. It has limited our ability to lead around the world, to spur collective action on global progress, and to marshal resources around transnational threats. And that includes our ability to lead on women's issues. We've spent the better part of a decade on gender integration efforts at the State Department and across the government. A large part of my job was to encourage and assist US diplomats on integrating gender into their work. And as the best and brightest leave the department, um, the, 
and the department sort of hobbles along, our ability to consider and include women in our work is really diminished. Under the Obama administration, as Valerie mentioned, I helped draft and implement four key strategies on women and girls, including the first U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. These strategies, thankfully, are still in place, um, but their continued implementation requires commitment, requires leadership. At this moment, there is no political leadership in the Office of Global Women's Issues that I ran. Ambassador posts and senior positions around the globe are also vacant, and those leadership positions are essential to galvanizing action and policy commitments to women and girls. Internally, few people are paying attention to these issues, and that means that externally there is a lack of leadership on women, peace, and security at a moment when there are dozens of crises that are keeping women powerless and voiceless around the world. So where do we go from here? First, I would say we need to have the international community continue to carry forward these efforts. The UN has made some modest progress here. Um, for example, the peacekeeping mandates for West Sahara, for Sudan, Somalia now include language on women's participation. And within its own ranks, the UN is trying. Um, you know, they've released a report to how they, how they can increase the number of women in leadership. And I think hopefully over time that will, that will begin to show some real progress. Other countries are doing some great work. Um, Prime Minister Trudeau, I, I, you saw him there briefly when I passed him, <laughs> announced that Canada will launch a $15 million fund to recruit women into military and police personnel for peacekeeping missions, and that's really important. But on some level, we have to hope that the United States has left the playing field only temporarily. And that's really where civil society comes in. That's where all of you come in. I can tell you during the Obama administration, civil society was absolutely key to our work, especially the groups based here at home. Um, this is a picture, finally, of an advocate who came in and she presented thousands of signatures uh, from groups urging the United States to do more to end child marriage. It's funny, I used to, my staff hated this, but I used to say that we would do civil society um, consultations and briefings, and I used to joke that it was sometimes like getting your teeth cleaned. It wasn't always the most pleasant experience because you would meet with them and they would say, look, the United States has made commitments to do X, Y, and Z. Why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing it better? Why aren't you doing it faster? And they were all really legitimate questions, but you know, it's not so much fun to have to try to defend all that. But at the end of the day, just like getting your teeth cleaned, it's really important, right? We need to have civil society as active members of this process. Um, and I used to tell diplomats in other countries that as well. And you know, in many places, civil society is being squashed. And I think that for the United States to stand up and say, look, this is critically important, makes a difference. Uh, we need to keep collecting data. And we need to keep making the, the case for why and how women, peace, and security is so important to what we do. Along those lines, Georgetown um, Inst Institute on Women, Peace, and Security recently launched an index that measures women's inclusion and security in 153 countries. It'll be interesting to see um, how, that, how that goes forward. No surprise, of course, that Iceland, Norway, and Switzerland are at the top of the list, and Syria, Afghanistan, and Yemen are at the bottom. Um, but, you know, hopefully over time, just being able to see the data is, will help us. And, of course, the incredible work that you all are doing with Valerie at the, on the Women's Stats Program, is, it makes such a difference because it's not just talk. It's right that we have data to show what's going on, and it really makes a huge difference. Um, and I think it will help civil society and help us prepare to move forward when the United States hopefully, once again, you know, decides to champion gender equality on the global stage. So civil society, academics, researchers all have a role to play in urging our government to live up to our own ideals of equality and opportunity. Um, last month, President George W. Bush spoke in New York. Uh, he made it clear why so many people here at home and around the world are anxious about the state of U.S. leadership. He said the health of the democratic spirit itself is at issue, and the renewal of that spirit is the urgent task at hand. When I visited countries that were struggling, I often emphasized how civil society could help move a country forward. And now our country needs to take that advice as well. We can't lead on women, peace, and security around the world if we're struggling with inclusion, equality, and democracy here at home. And so, while we continue the focus on how to promote women in peacekeeping efforts, in conflict prevention, in conflict resolution, and so on, we have to look inside our own borders as well, and we have to strengthen our institutions. That means doing the hard work of healing wounds around justice, opportunity, and inequality. 
And it also means making the case to the American people that U.S. leadership matters. Their support is really the cornerstone of any U.S. effort to promote women in global security. When I served as ambassador, people often asked if I ever got discouraged uh, by how bad it truly can be for women and girls out there. And it's true. I mean, that work is incredibly challenging. And I, you know, I used to take comfort from the, the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. I'm sure you've all heard them before, given that you're interested in these issues. But essentially, that, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but ultimately it bends towards justice. And I always held on to that. And I thought, you know, even if it's slow, even if we take steps back, ultimately the world is moving in a more peaceful direction and a more inclusive direction. I've doubted that you know, a few times, I have to say, over the last year. But the one thing I do know for sure is that that bend does not happen on its own. It happens because people like you work tirelessly for progress, are committed to progress, care about progress. And that's why I'm delighted that you have this program here at Texas a and i I'm delighted to be a, a part of this discussion today. And I really look forward to taking your questions. So thanks so much. Kathy, I'm so grateful for you being here. Um, this is a, a topic that I think will only grow in importance. I think the moment that we're having now, where our country is, is knee deep in discussing relations between men and women, right, is uh, a kind of opening a space to talk about you know, why aren't women being listened to? Why aren't women being included and so forth? So um, I'm going to talk with Kathy for a few minutes first, and then uh, we will move on um, to having a, um, uh, an, an, an open discussion with the audience. I want to also point out that when we break, we are going to have a, a 10 to 15 minute break, and we do have coffee and other drinks in the classroom that is just to the left of this theater. So if you want to get something at that time, please feel um, free. Okay, so Kathy, let's start with the good news because good news is always better than bad news. I want you to tell us a little bit about the Women, Peace, and Security Act. You mentioned it in your remarks, but let's talk about um, the specific good things that it does and how much bipartisan support there was for this. Well, the interesting thing about the act is that it codifies what we were trying to do through our national action plan. But it's a, it's a message from Congress, and it was a bipartisan message. As I said, it was um, Senator Jean Shaheen from New Hampshire is a Democrat who has been very uh, forward thinking on these issues. And Shelley Moore Capito is a Republican from um, West Virginia. And I think they work together very, very closely, and, I, and we're concerned about making it clear that Congress cares about this. And in a way, I think Congress is reacting to um, what they're seeing about kind of cuts at the department, pulling back from U.S. funding overseas. And I think Congress was trying to make it clear that they continue to care about these issues. Um, it requires the, the federal government to do a strategy. It's funny, when I, I worked on Capitol Hill, we were always writing things requiring Congress, re requiring the administration to do strategies. It's like, and then you get into the, into the White House and you're like, for the love of God with these strategies, because you're constantly <laughs> doing strategies. So it's like, it's a kind of a give and take between the, you know, who has the control over doing what. But it is, what, it is Congress's way to make it clear that it's a priority for them and it forces the administration to do some work that they, you know, otherwise, I mean, they, they're doing it. We were doing the work, but it was just this, this constant reporting um, that got to be a little bit challenging. So now they have to do, I think they have one year to do a strategy. And the idea is, you know, ha what is the United States government doing to make sure that there are more women participating across the board in these efforts? And it, it's important because it sends a message you know, worse, first, as I said, that it's a bipartisan effort, and second, that, that the continued um, leadership of the United States is important. Yes. Um, <clears throat> prior to this legislation, the National Action Plan had been, in a sense, uh, simply by executive order, and the accountability was all within the executive branch. But with the Women, Peace, and Security Act, now there's congressional accountability. And I'm assuming that there'll be torchbearers in Congress who will make sure that that accountability happens. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I, I hope that even if this legislation hadn't passed, that, th that the administration would continue to do the work. There, we had just done an update on the NAP um, last year. It is, it's, it's definitely 
time consuming. You know, it's hard to do it and it does require political commitment. I mean, the White House was committed, the State Department was committed, the Pentagon was committed, even with all that, it's just, it's, it's a lot of work. So I think Congress wanted to make sure that that would continue and it's great. I mean, I'm so happy that they passed it. Um, I'm not entirely clear and I don't think anyone is yet how it relates to the existing NAP, but you know, fine, they'll work it out. I mean, it, I think it's just important that Congress has weighed in here and made it clear that women's participation is a priority for them. That's terrific. Well, let's turn from happiness to maybe something a little less than happiness. Um, you head up the, um, headed up the Office of Global Women's Issues, and of course, some of us from afar were going through a heartache as we saw that the, the very first budget uh, draft from the Trump administration zeroed out the funding for the Office of Global Women's Issues entirely. Uh, and then we know that, um, you know, before you left during um, the transition period, that it, it certainly looked like um, that, that you were be being given signals that GWE, as it's known, uh, would be on the chopping block. So um, what was happening and how did it turn around? And do you still think the threat is there or has the threat abated by the the bipartisan passing of things like the Women, Peace, and Security Act? Well, it's, it's a complicated situation right now. I think in, in the best light, I would say that the administration has a perspective, has a view um, that there were too many, what they call, you know, sort of the, these um, kind of, uh, I can't remember the word for it, but it's essentially like ambassadors at large and these special envoys, and they didn't like that. And I think that Secretary Tillerson in particular is, you know, kind of a, uh, like an, uh, an operations guy, right? So he looks at it and he's like, I don't like this. There are too many special appointees around the department. And there were a lot. I mean, I have to say that. There's like somebody for the Chad Basin, and some, you know, lots of different envoys. Um, and I think that the, the, the women's um, ambassador got looped into that. And that was just a, a mis I mean, you could argue that they needed a lot of these different envoys. I, you know, that wasn't my my concern, honestly. Um, but looping, lumping in the global women's effort with all of these, I think, was a fundamental mistake on their part for two reasons. One, because the reason that the office was established and the way it worked is, I I reported directly to the secretary, and that was because we believed that gender was a cross-cutting issue, right? That every every department in the State Department needed to be concerned about it. So it didn't really fit into any of the other um, bureaus or offices. And I think that that is correct, honestly. We spent so much time with our colleagues. I mean, we did endless toolkits and strategies, briefings, trying to work with them to understand how to integrate gender into their work. And it's not just one thing. It's not just democracy promotion. It's economic. It's political. It's everything. So having it as a cross-cutting issue, I think, is important. and. I don't think that they fully appreciated that at the time. Now, the rumor, you know, they're, they're in the process of doing this reorganization, and I think they are going to move it into a bureau, which I think is a mistake, but it is at least better than getting rid of it altogether. Um, I think they didn't quite understand how devoted the community, the civil society community, and the congressional supporters are to these issues. And um, I think they got tremendous pushback. Um, they, you know, the, the, there were pieces in the New York Times. I mean, there, there was a lot of attention paid to this. And I think they realized that this is not helpful to them. And they've decided, you know, to back off from that. I think that the other piece of it is that um, Ivanka Trump, you know, is out talking about how she cares about women's issues. They're doing this Women's Entrepreneurship Fund. And so it put her in a terrible position, right? If they're gonna, if she's out promoting this and they're getting rid of the office. It just, it, it wasn't really a tenable position for them. So, you know, we are months, months, months into this and we still don't have a nominee. They, there was a rumor of somebody getting um, appointed a couple of weeks ago, um, a woman who runs something called Concerned Women for America. And she's now, she put out a piece saying that she's not, she's not going to go forward. So. Um, I imagine they're back to you know the beginning of the process, and that that's not that's not good, and because right now the office still exists, and there are tr just terrific people working there. Uh, you know, civil servants who have been working in the government for years, who are totally devoted, so 
patriotic, they care about the country, they care about this work, but there's no leadership in the office. Um, and these issues require constant pushing, right? So without leadership, it really is challenging. Um, it needs, you need to be able to work with the White House, work with your colleagues across the interagency, uh, and not having somebody there is, is not, not, a good, not a good situation, honestly. But I, I mean, I do take comfort. I, I see these, these people who work in the office, they're continuing to press every day on the issues that they work on. Somebody asked me, ah, yes, about uh, a woman who, um, la named Lita Nouri who's been there, who was there before I got there and is an Afghan-American who's been working in the Afghanistan pr portfolio forever. She has tremendous experience. And it's people like that who really are carrying forward these efforts, and we need to try to support them as best we can. And it's, it's just tough going there, honestly, for them, because they just, they never know what's gonna happen, and they, you know, they, they're, right now, all, um, they c nobody can move from one department to another, um, and they're, you know, concerned about the numbers of people who are leaving the Foreign Service. I mean, it's, it's just really incredible to see it. Um, so we got to just hope that those, that those people will, will continue to do the work for as long as possible. Wow. Um, let's talk about um, kind of um, looking forward. If, if you were still in your position, <coughs> let's say, <coughs> what issues do you think that you would be wanting GWE to, to focus on? What are, what are kind of the issues that, that if the Trump administration um, had an open mind towards seeing the, the intersections, would you be trying to suggest are important um, at this point? So, for example, our first panel is gonna be on Afghanistan, and yet I have seen zip, nada, nothing, right? About, um, you know, Afghan women, uh, or, or, or what, you know, we, we owe the population in terms of human security. There's been no discussion whatsoever. But what sorts of things would be on um, your agenda? Well, I mean, there are many, many things. Afghanistan certainly one of them, given the tremendous um, work that has gone on there, the commitment the United States has made, what we have really, s our country has sacrificed there, and the Afghans have sacrificed so much for the progress that has been made. And you know, you can see it. The numbers are so much better in terms of the numbers of girls in school and health care for women and life expectancy and all the rest of it. But the challenges are absolutely tremendous. And I think you know, President Ghani is trying really hard. Um, Mrs. Ghani is amazing, really devoted to these. I'm, I just love the fact that she continues to work with Mrs. Bush. I think that's just you know such an important signal. Um, but it, it's it's a tough. It's a tough place. I mean, I went, I would, told this story before, but I went to a school there. Um, it was a boarding school for girls. It was early on in my tenure. And I was giving a talk. And, you know, I mean, it, this was by far the best part of my job, is meeting with girls around the world. I just, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And these girls knew I was a lawyer. So at the end, I always say, you know, what, what do you, what do you, what do you want to do with your lives? And these girls mostly had been born after 9-11, right? They, that's how young they were. Um, and so they say, oh, you know, I, I want to be a lawyer. I mean, there are many people who want to be lawyers because I said, you know, because they knew I was a lawyer. And then some said, I want to be, um, one wanted to be a doctor. And then another girl said, I, I want to be president of Afghanistan. And I was like, wow, this is so great. You know, I walked out and I was like, there's progress. I felt so good about it. I felt like really optimistic about the country. And as I was getting into the car, um, somebody took me aside and pointed at one of the girls and they said, you know, I just wanted you to s come over and say hello to her. Um, you know, right before she got here, her father had tried to sell her to satisfy a debt. And I, I just remember being so crushed by that. I, I just thought, you know, I think because I was so happy about what I had seen, but the reality that those girls live through is so challenging. It is so challenging. And I think we need to, we need to continue to do the work. We need to continue to support. It's not, not that the United States can solve the problem. It's that the women and girls and the men in that country who care about it will solve the problem. But we need to support them. We need to be standing with them. I, on, the, on what I would be doing, it was interesting because we, um, the last year of, of the of the Obama administration had made some progress on something that really I have been I've believed in for a long time, um, but it's hard to do, and that that's this. We chose a couple of countries through a long process between state and USAID, where we would try to do a more comprehensive approach to the issues 
uh, that relate to women and girls. So what does that mean? We were looking at saying, okay, what we really need to do in any given situation, and if you think about your own lives, you think about how logical this is, you need to increase political participation, right? You need to increase participation in the community, women's ability to get out and be a part of what's going on. You need to get more women in the formal economy. They, you know, I mean, women everywhere work harder than anything I've ever seen in my life, but frequently they're not in the formal economy, which has all sorts of negative implications for them. You need to make sure that barriers like gender-based violence are being addressed. It is hard to tell women, you need to go participate, you need to go work, you need to do X, Y, and Z when they're being battered, either in their communities or their homes. And finally, you need to get girls educated. And if you can do all those things at once, then every one of those efforts will be more successful, right? If you think about it, it's so logical. However, it is very, very hard to do that, right? The US government, it, the way we typically do our work is somebody will come to us with a, we'll put out a, a, a proposal saying we want to do a gender-based violence program in X country. And then we get, you know, all sorts of solicitations back and we try to figure out how to go forward. Um, and that's the way the government works. And those programs are typically doing one thing or another, right? It's a girls' education effort. It's a GBV effort. It's a women's um, economic effort. And that's honestly what the administration is doing now. They're doing some work on women's economic empowerment, which is important. But you can't do those things in isolation. It does, it's just not as effective. And what you need to do, and, and just as an example, a lot of times when we would do work with women entrepreneurs, you would see that as the power dynamic in their family started to shift because they had some more independence, because they had some economic independence, that you would frequently see an uptick in violence in the family because, you know, it's not surprising, right? You see men, a lot of times, and this is in post-conflict settings, you see this a lot, they're uncertain, they're having trouble finding jobs, the women start to make some income, and then the women are kind of like, hey, you know, quit bossing me around, basically, and then there's more, more battery. So, okay. We know that's going to happen. That doesn't mean don't do the program. It means plan for it. You know, make sure that there's counseling for the women, that, there's count that you bring the men in and explain why this is good for their families and work with them like that. So we tried to do this more comprehensive approach. The president agreed to it. We were going to start, and we have started. It's going on now in Malawi and Tanzania. And then we announced that we would move to um, Nepal and to Laos. Um, you know, now, the program is going on in Malawi a bit, and I think that's probably it for now. Um, but the idea was to say, look, let's take all U.S. government funding and let's, let's organize it better. Let's make sure that we know. Most of the funding going in from the U.S. government into Malawi was PEPFAR money. We, you know, I'm a huge, huge PEPFAR fan. And what you know, they're trying to do is reduce HIV AIDS around the world. Well, what do they see when they, they do the research? They see that the, biggest, the place where you're seeing the biggest um, growth in HIV is young girls. Why? because they're getting stuck with these older men. They have no power to negotiate in a relationship to say, you know, we need to use safe sex practices or let's not have sex or whatever it is. And so if you can get a hold of these girls, try to keep them in school, hopefully that'll help with the HIV prevalence in those countries. And so we were working with PEPFAR, we were working with MCC, we were working across the U.S. government to try to do better. USDA was a part of it, to, you know, helping on the, on the food side and saying, look, we, maybe we need to provide food to keep these girls in school. It was, it was just a whole of... Um, sort of U.S. government effort that we were trying to put together, and then trying to work with our partners, our international pa partners, and say, look, this is what we're trying to do, and see where their efforts would fit into it. Um, and I think that that, my view a year ago, maybe a year ago in a month or something, was that that was kind of the way the future would go, that that is how the United States government should do these efforts in the, in the future, and that they would be more successful. And it is, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is why I've taken up yoga, okay, because I'm like <laughs> so upset every day, but I, because inner I, peace, yeah, inner, inner peace, peace yeah, exactly, <laughs> because I know that, that this is the way that we should be doing the work. I, I know that in my heart. I've seen it enough. I know, I know it, and I am, you know, I went around the world kind of talking to women and girls and talking on behalf of the United States, saying that, you know, if you will support women and girls in your country to leaders in these countries, we will be your partner. And I, you know, I, I, I am upset about that, <laughs> to say the least. But I am hopeful that, you know, as I said in my, in my remarks, that our partners will step up, that there are amazing organizations in the United States, I mean, absolutely amazing NGOs who are doing so much work around the world. 
And I think that there are diplomats and aid workers and others who are still out there who understand the importance of it and will continue to carry it forward. And hopefully, you know, once things settle down and we're hopefully back in the position that we used to be where U.S. commitment um, to these issues, and again, on a bipartisan basis, is, is the norm and is the way we will move forward. And hopefully we can make up for whatever traction we've lost. But I tell you, it is I in the best of circumstances, with everybody moving in, a, in the most positive direction, it's still really, really hard. And without that, it's, you know, there, will be, there will be real backsliding, and that's just the, the way it is. And I think we just have to try to think about how to make it better as we go forward. That's great. Not to be so discouraging, I'm sorry. But, but that's why you guys are so important, because you're young, and you're you know, optimistic, and you have a lot of energy, and we're getting old, and you guys need to, like, <laughs> you guys need to get out there and do this work. I mean, it's absolutely critical. Well, what I'd like to do is to begin to open it up to questions. And so we have um, a young lady here whose name, tell me your name again. Chauncey. Chauncey, who has a microphone. And we would like to hear some questions from you. So please come up and, and ask. While we're waiting for the first brave so person. Ah, oh, no, we don't have to wait. There's the first brave person. Uh, my name is Aziz Badri. I'm from Kabul, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I live in the Dallas Fort Worth area right now. Uh, I have a comment, then a question. The comment is whenever I talk about Afghanistan to uh, uh, audiences, I ask them one question Which country do you think gave the, the right to women to vote, Afghanistan or U.S.? Mm -hmm. Of course, they say U.S., mm -hmm. but it was Afghanistan, 1919. Uh, and, and of course the U.S. in 1920. Uh, uh, my, back in 1964, uh, when the King's Shop passed the new constitution, you know, women participated in politics. Actually, we had more women teaching, more women doctors than we had male at that time. Uh, women t walked around Kabul in short skirts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but now, of course, Taliban set back the country oh, at least 100 years, especially for women. So my question is, what would advice would you give to the government of Afghanistan, people of Afghanistan, to promote the right of women? Listen, Afghanistan is, um, you know, it's, it's at the same time a heartbreaking place and a really optimistic place for me. That was my experience. I think that I think that President Ghani understands what he needs to do. I, I do. I think he understands that getting girls educated and getting women into the economy is really important to the country. He has very challenging political dynamics that he's dealing with, and you see continued violence there, which is, you know, it's unsettling to people, certainly. And um, I, I think he is on, he's on the path. It's just he's going to have to stick to it. And the role of the United States, I, you know, it's, it's, it's really still critical. You know, when I, even when I was in the government, there was talk about the United States pulling back, really reducing the numbers of troops and all the rest of it. Um, and the interesting thing about that was it wasn't just that there was then uncertainty in the in the especially out in the in the different parts of the country about you know their own security, but it meant that aid organizations in other countries were talking about pulling back because without the United States securing these areas, it made everybody more. And so the the ripple effect of the United States pulling back is really serious. Um, so I think they just have to try to keep at it, try to keep those girls in school. You know, they've made tremendous progress on that front, but there's a long way to go. And I think trying to work with the, the you know, the folks out in these different regions is really important. Um, and w some of the interesting work that we've seen is kind of working with men and boys, working with religious leaders, trying to get them to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And if you can get to that point, it would be tremendously um, positive, but it's it's tough. I mean, I just can't, you know, I can't say that clearly enough. I, I don't think that it's an easy place, uh, and I think I think the notion that the United States can do X, Y, and Z and then get out of there, I just don't think that that's, I don't think that's right. I think we have to, we have to be there for the long term. We have to make that commitment. Other countries will do it as well, 
um, and Afghanistan just needs time. It, it really, I mean, what happened to that country, you're right, it was in such a different situation, and it was such a dramatic, um, and it wasn't just the Taliban, it was, you know, years of war, right, with Russia and other places. I mean, it's terrible, uh, the things that have happened there. So, but the, the thing that's interesting to me is that I, it always reminds me, like, I think I had this naive idea, and I, and I sort of referred to this a little bit in my remarks, but that the world was moving in a positive way, right? And overall, that is true. Like, we have fewer people in extreme <laughs> poverty. You know, we've made some real progress. Um, that levels, there was an interesting book, Stephen Pinker, I'm sure you saw it, saying overall that levels of violence are down. But there's no, pro there's no guarantee of that. And Afghanistan is a good example of that, right? Where things can be moving along in a positive way, but it can, it can easily slide back, and we have to pay attention to that. We can't just assume that things are okay. And I think the thing about this election, and you know, again, I, I mean, people have different political views, and I'm not really talking about that, but just in general, I think that women felt after this election very much like, you know, they had a, a, an expectation of where the world was heading, where the United States was, and that that was shaken up. And I think that's why you saw so many people come out at the Women's March, because they were like, wait, hey, wait a second. You know, it, this is not about electing a Republican. Plenty of these people are Republicans. This, that never would have happened if Mitt Romney had been elected in the last go-round. This was very much about electing a man who women saw as not really on their side. And the women were like, hey, wait, we're, no, we're not okay with that. And I think, you know, you referred to this, sort of this, all this work that's going on now on, on sexual harassment. I think that women have a little bit kind of had enough you know, and they're speaking up, and that's, I think, a positive, and, you know, we'll see where that goes. I'm sure there'll be overreactions and corrections and all the rest of it, but just in general, I think women are saying, you know, look, we, we're, not, we're not okay with this. We want to keep moving in a more positive way. Terrific. Do we have another question? <coughs> Hi, my name is Kelsey Ritchie, and I'm a first year global policy student in the master's program at the LBJ School at the University of Texas. Um, thank you so much for being here today and for all the work that you've done, and hearing about that was truly inspiring. Um, one of the area that I'm interested in hearing your perspective on is the recent announcement by the government in Saudi Arabia to allow women to drive. And kind of what does that mean for women in the country? And also, what are the opportunities of the United States to support um, the Vision 2030 plan in Saudi Arabia? And what does that mean for women in the Middle East and in that area in general? Yeah. It's a really good question. Um, Saudi Arabia is such a fascinating place. Um, you know, I, I, I spent some time there. And it was interesting because when you're there, I mean, first of all, I met some of the most amazing women who were doing incredible work, lawyers, um, business people. Um, and they kept saying, you, you know, the United States needs to stop talking about women driving. Like, this is not the only issue that we care about. And I said, I get that, but you have to understand, for Americans especially, you know, like their cars, I mean, that, that freedom that comes with driving. It's like, I, could, I remember when I turned 16, I felt like, wow, like life is now different. You know, I can go do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. And I, that, you have to understand how, how fundamental that is to our understanding of liberty and independence. And um, so in any case, I, I think that, um, you know, what's happening in, in, a, in, in Saudi Arabia now is interesting, right? There's this a young crown prince um, is making a lot of changes. He's trying to make a lot of changes fast. Um, and he, you know, has detained a lot of people in the, the Four Seasons or something in Riyadh. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of a prison situation at the Four Seasons. But anyway, um, so there's a lot going on there, and I think there is um, a sense that young people in particular want the country to move forward. They don't like to be seen as backwards around the world. And again, the driving thing just became such a, a big symbol for that. Um, I think that, you know, the danger for the crown prince is that he's trying to do a lot of things at one time, trying to make a lot of change at one time, and I think there's a danger that, you know, there'll, there'll be a reaction to that. Um, but it it's, sort of goes back to my fundamental point. I, I like to believe that everyone in the world is moving towards more freedom and independence, um, and that women are a key part of that. But um, you know, I think I tend to be a little bit of a Pollyanna, honestly, when it comes to that. And I, I do know that there are 
strong forces in these countries that push back and they push back hard and that women become kind of a just a symbol that you know they they sort of glom onto as like you know all the bad from the west and the bad of, of uh, progress that is you know sort of challenging their ideas their norms you know i can't tell you how many times i've heard people around the world say to me well, you know, we would talk about gender-based violence, and I would say, well, you know, not so good to beat your wife, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, you don't understand. You, you don't, we actually care about our families. We care about family. And I'm like, honestly, I care about families too, all right? I have a family. I care about my family. I, but that is like the, the, the sort of reaction that the United States doesn't understand the fundamental values that these, that these folks hold. And there's just a, there's always a pushback. I mean, you see it in Afghanistan. You see it everywhere where they, you know, they, they push back hard. These forces that care a lot on the other side, on the more repressive, what I consider more repressive side, care very, very much. And the question always is, do the people who care about the liberty and the freedom and the progress care as much? And will they, will they push as hard as the people on the other side? And I think, you know, it's a problem we see in the United States, too. I, I used to work on judges um, when I was in the, on the Senate Judiciary Committee staff. And the people who wanted very conservative judges were very vocal, right? They would push their members hard. They were organized. It's a similar issue, a similar thing on, on people who care a lot about gun control. They, you know, they, the advocates for, for guns and for whatever they want to say are, are very aggressive, very active. And the question always is on the other side. We're like, yeah, that's not so great, but are we out there? Are we fighting for it? Do we care as much? Do we, are we doing as much on, on the other side as they are? And, and in, uh, you see it play out here. You see it play out in other countries. And I think we have to always be mindful of that. So we'll see with Saudi Arabia. My, my sense is that it is moving. It is opening up a bit. Uh, I think, you know, the driving thing is like, I think they have a year to study it or whatever. The weird thing about Saudi Arabia is apparently they have like the worst drivers in the world. The men are not trained to drive. It's like super dangerous. And so I met with a guy who was really interesting and he said, you know, what we should do is have a driving school for women and start that way because it was even, it was against the law. When I was there, this happened that a woman drove her husband to the hospital because he was having a heart attack and she got thrown in jail for that. And I was like, for the love of Pete. So I think that you know, his, his theory was, let's start a driving school so we can say, in an emergency, women have to be able to drive, but train the women to drive, and then ultimately the women will be better drivers than the men. I don't know. Maybe they all need to just do some more driving, <laughs> but I, yeah. School. But I do think, I, I believe that it, it's going to start to change, because, it, you know, Saudi Arabia, I mean, there's so many international people working in Riyadh, but they've got big challenges, you know, just with trying, the, we try to get more women in the economy there, and the United States has been Actually, like GE has a really interesting program there where they have, it's a whole um, sort of an office building that's just women. And they, they've been very successful. They got these women to come out and work and they had to work with the families and make sure they were getting rides to and from. Um, but I think that uh, it, it'll help their economy ultimately. They, a lot of the, um, the sort of the rap against the, the Saudi men is that they don't really want to work that hard. So the women are out there trying to, trying to fill in the, in the space. So we'll see. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm generally optimistic about it. Um, and as I said, when you meet those Saudi women, they are, they are really a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, I think one of the, the realities on the ground is that there are incredible women highly intelligent, mm -hmm. energetic, ambitious, determined, tenacious women in every single society. And so what we should be doing, I think, is sort of unleashing that mm -hmm. potential, you know, rather than uh, trying to guide anything, just mm -hmm. say, you know, let's help get these women mobile. Let's help get these women the toolkits exactly. that they need. Let's help get these women get the support. And they will do it all by themselves, really. Do we have another question? There's some. Um, Ambassador Russell, thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for your service. I'm a second year Masters of International Affairs student here and I'm curious about what your thoughts are on the role women are playing in the displacement crisis and if you see any particular issues, issues that they face because of their gender. Thank you. Displacement, you mean refugees and, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you know, listen, it, I think the thing to keep in mind is in any situation, okay, no mat almost no matter what it is, if you think about a, a natural disaster, if you think about something like a, a, a refugee setting, women and children are more vulnerable and tend to suffer more. That's, that's I mean, it's just, it's sort of obvious in a way, right? And I think that what, one of the things that we tried to do was to say, you know, especially when you see refugee camps, and I, I've been to many of them, unfortunately. Um, but it's so interesting because you get there and they say, oh, you know, we realize that women, when they go to search for firewood, are being attacked, or when they go to the bathrooms, they're, they're vulnerable to abuse. And um, so we, we started this initiative called Safe from the Start, which is to say, okay, since this happens in virtually every situation, how about if we plan for it from the beginning and say, <coughs> excuse me, let's make sure that when we're planning where to put the bathrooms, we're thinking about whether it's a safe place for women to go. Let's make sure that there are lights. Let's, you know, all these like really basic things. Um, and I think that work is continuing. Um, but look, it's, it's very, the, the practical realities are very challenging for women in these settings. They tend to be more women with children in these refugee settings in the first place. Um, you know, it's almost impossible for them to work in these places. Um, their children are frequently, um, you know, under occupied, I guess, or, you know, they just, they don't have things to do. I mean, just trying to make sure that there are schools being built, that there are activities for these kids is really important. Um, you know, you see women, I think, can play a really important role in so many ways, you know, preserving their families, building their communities. Um, but these places can also, and this is one of the worries, right, that now I think that, you know, I've seen different numbers on this, but one, one was kind of that most refugee, people who's, who are now in refugee communities are staying there for an average of like 11 to 15 years, yeah. right? So they're not really, it's not a short-term problem anymore. This is like people are in the Dab refugee camp and they're there, they, people have been born there, they live there. Um, and what are we doing about that? You know, how are we addressing that? Because typically it's been dealt with as a humanitarian issue as compared to a development issue, right? So you have different elements of the governments working on that. And it's not a long-term, we don't address it as a long-term problem, but it is a long-term problem. It's very, you know, it's, it's difficult and it's difficult. You see, we, we have places now where we do gender-based violence training because we know what's going on because this, you know, it, obviously it happens every, if one in three women is facing some form of violence in their lifetime, it's happening everywhere anyway. But in these situations of extreme stress, it's much worse, right? And so we, we need to be able to address that. Um, so I think that, you know, these, there are just so many challenges every step of the way. Um, one other place where we've done some interesting work is looking at when you get to the immigrant communities in some of these, in some countries, particularly in Europe, um, and, and also in the United States, but doing the countering violent extremism work, and the women can be helpful on that as well because they can see what's going on in their communities. And there, there's a famous story about Afghan women who, um, I, I can't remember exactly the details, but um, essentially they went to, um, the, the leaders in their community and they said, you know, there's some strange men coming to us to talk about getting, I think, hiring men to go someplace to work. And they said, we think there's something fishy about that. And they went, I think they went to Kabul and the, they met with some minister and the, they got threw him out of the office said, go away, you don't know what you're talking about. And of course, they end up, these guys are terrorists and they set off a bomb in the community. And so women can be really important, right? Because they're in the community, they hear things. And if we can work with them and try to, you know, support them and make it possible for them to be a part of these discussions, I think that would be tremendously helpful. But I would say from start to finish, these situations are incredibly challenging for women. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're addressing those concerns and trying to make it possible for these women to be the leaders in their way that they can. I'm uh, going to ask just the last question because we're just about to have a break. And that is, you can see some um, bright young faces here in the audience, which I think gives all of us hope. What would be your advice to them? What if they care about these issues? What would you advise them to do? Well, I mean, a year ago, I would have said, come, <laughs> come work for me at the State Department. Now I would say, um, you know, there are, there are places that you can do this work. And I, I wouldn't give up on the U.S. government yet because I, you know, for me, traveling around the world, I was always, even in places where we were being criticized for things, I was so proud to represent the United States. And I believed in what we were doing, and I believed that the United States could be a force for good around the world. 
And yes, you know, have we done things that are not so great? Yes. Are there conflicts challenging to communities and even conflicts that we're involved in? Yes. Um, but overall, I feel like the United States stands for something, and we mean something to people around the world. And we have an incredible opportunity because of the strength and wealth of our country to help people in other places. And I think, as Valerie said, not tell them what to do, but help them be who they want to be and live the lives with dignity that they want to live. And so I think, you know, look, you can go work for members of Congress. As I mentioned, they're doing really good work. So, you know, and, and especially for young folks, get out there and intern. I know you, I know that's part of the program here. I think it's really good. Get in there, see what you like, see what you don't like. I, I remember I worked in my first I worked on a presidential campaign right after I got out of college, and a friend kept telling me to come work on this campaign, and I said, I, I cannot. I, I am like the shyest person ever. I never wanted to have to talk in front of people. Oh my God, I, I hated it. I just was like, no way, I cannot do that. And I started doing it, and I realized that I cared more about what I was doing than I cared about the fact that I didn't want to have to speak in front of people. And so over time, obviously now, you, you know, you can't, you can't get me to stop, but I, I realized that, you know, what I, for me, being a part of something that I really cared about, a, a, something that was much bigger than myself, was, was such a, an incredible privilege and what made me happy. So go figure that out for yourselves. You know, you guys can do tremendous work. There, there are options in the government. There are great NGOs that are doing things everywhere. I mean, really tremendous work. Um, and also, I mean, I think what you can do that nobody else can do is bring your own experience to it. Look at questions and say, you know, yeah, okay, we, we have experience, we've done a lot of things, um, but we certainly don't know all the answers. You know, take a fresh look at things. You know, think about if you were just starting from scratch, starting, you know, if you could do anything you wanted to do, what would you try to do? And, and go figure out a way to do it. I mean, it's your life, it's your world. You guys need to, you guys need to own it and change it and be a part of what happens in the future. And it can be really discouraging. Everything can be discouraging. But what good is that, right? Be discouraged today and then get about it tomorrow. And go do something. And use this amazing education that you've gotten, the amazing opportunities you have, and make a difference in the world.